Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer from Ukraine, uh, but I came here to speak to you just as ordinary citizen from Ukraine who witnessed all the protests uh, during the past months in Ukraine. You might heard a lot about all these difficulties and maybe challenges that our people faced. And actually media and social media, they played a very big role in all this process. You click just uh, on your laptop just in one second and you can share any political message and which will read thousands and thousands of people and this political message can influence on actions of thousands of people who come to the square Maidan in Kiev and maybe it is one step ahead that we have such powerful tool as Facebook and other social media which make some systems and structures uh, change. But is it really a step ahead? Or maybe we still continue to repeat all mistakes from the past, but now the consequences are much more um, worse because these tools are so powerful. These days, I think about my grandmother more and more. Each 9th of May, she was watching documentaries about World War II. And I remember her watching these documentaries and I was a kid and I asked her, please stop it, I want to watch Disney Cinderella and Lion King. And I thought it's more close to reality because reality is so, you know, happy. And I thought that war was in the past and there will be no any war again. And it's just black and white boring videos. But it seems we still have some lessons to learn. My uh, grandmother and grandfather, they moved from Moscow to Crimea, which is the peninsula uh, in south of Ukraine in 60s and my grandfather uh, served as military there. Then in 90s the USSR collapsed and it became uh, uh, different uh, independent countries like Belarus, Russia, Ukraine. So we became Ukrainians. We, we are originally from Moscow. We spoke Russian, we felt Russian, we never spoke Ukrainian. Uh, I grew up reading Dostoevsky, Chekhov, Tolstoy. I never were interested in Ukrainian culture, but still we had Ukrainian passports and we were part of the country. Uh, and at the same time, although we, are, although we are different and we speak Russian language, and, but still it's difficult to call us as minority because actually half of Ukrainian population speak Russian. And even when I studied in law school in central Ukraine, I lived uh, with a friend who spoke Ukrainian and all four years we spoke with her in different languages in the same time. I would speak to her in Russian and she would answer in Ukrainian and we even didn't uh, notice the difference. So it's very similar and, and we really feel as a part of one, a part of one country. We have the same values, we have almost the same history, but still these issues as language and uh, ethnic origin and they're very uh, vulnerable because while we are feeling the same, we feel afraid that someone will show us that we are different. And it is very important to treat these differences and characteristics um, that differ us very gently. And I learned it also from my uh, practical experience working with refugees. I worked with uh, people from Pakistan who suffered from uh, religious uh, uh, violence, religious conflicts between Shia and Sunni Muslims. I worked with uh, uh, people who flee, uh, fled uh, Kyrgyzstan because of clashes between Uzbeks and Kyrgyz. I also know people from Rwanda who has all this suffering inside themselves because of genocide. And actually we in the USSR also have great history of political persecution and I believe it's still in our blood. And 
so many people suffer just because of this labeling, because someone shows them that they're different because of their religion, ethnic origin, political opinion, or any other characteristic. So at the same time, it's very fundamental because these characteristics, they shape our identity and we cannot reject them, but at the same time, it shape and manifest our differences. So what actually happened in Ukraine and how it is relevant? Uh, as you might read in Western media, uh, Ukrainian people started to protest against uh, the former uh, president who rejected to sign the associate agreement with the EU. And uh, me actually, I was indifferent to this protest in the beginning because I thought that I'm Russian. These people ag protest against Russia, so I don't really want even to think about it like don't want to know what is my opinion about it and also it's quite an economic question because what is good for Ukraine in economic sense I'm stupid about all these numbers so I was like it's I don't care but then on 30 of November in the at, at night I woke up because I felt something is wrong I checked my <laughs> Facebook and iPhone and I saw the pictures like this so not so far from my apartment, from my house, this was happening at the square. And police just decided to attack peaceful protesters because they wanted to stop it. And this night, the major shift of my identity happened. I understood that, OK, I'm Russian. I speak Russian language. I, I don't want to switch and speak Ukrainian language just because of some principle. But still, I'm part of this, and i also responsible for this happening near, near me, near my house. So that time I understood that, yes, I'm Ukrainian. And although I speak another language, I'm originally from Moscow, still I'm Ukrainian, and I should be involved at least morally, or I should support uh, and do something about this. I should not stay indifferent. So, after this event, many more people realized that they also should be, take some active part in uh, society and they came into the square. And then the peaceful protest started again. It was like the phase two of Maidan. People were protesting peacefully and in Western media, you might read uh, that people still protesting for EU and against Russia, but actually it was not like this. People were protesting against injustice, against corruption in their country and for their dignity. And people called this revolution as revolution of dignity. So while people wanted their voices to be heard and they were staying there on minus 10, Celsius, they were freezing in the square 24-7. Media were, were reporting that they stay for EU. And this is the, and you can imagine that once you share this article that uh, gives wrong information, thousands of people share it on Facebook again and the wrong picture creates. So people were protesting peacefully several weeks but the government were still indifferent. They just didn't, they, they didn't do anything. And then on 16th of January, they adopted the law, the anti-protest law. With this law, they wanted to limit uh, freedom of protest and they also wanted to limit the uh, access to internet. And internet and Facebook played very important role in organizing community and interspreading uh, the objective information and even uh, about communicating needs of people at the square and so on. And actually, self-organization of Maidan was absolutely fantastic. People were bringing food to the square, they were cooking right there, they were sharing uh, hot drinks because it was very cold and they were very supportive and uh, it was really great, but this law came into force and people were waiting for how it will be applied. And they started to fear because according to this law, 
all people who were protesting at Maidan, they could be treated as criminals. So they were panicking and this mix of fear from people and ignorance from government, it led to clash between people and police. And there were many, many people participating in this clash. And there were pr professors, there were businessmen, there were people from different political parties, there were people from different civic organizations, and there were also people from the right political wing. So what Russian media made? They just concentrated on the <coughs> right wing and they just started to report that all the Ukrainians who protest uh, there in the city center of Kyiv, they all they represent the right wing of uh, uh, political right wing. They're all nationalists, they're fascists, and they started to create in media this fake image of enemy. And considering that we as Russian speaking people, we afraid that someone will hurt us, hurt in sense of our identity. People who live in the South Ukraine, they started to be afraid of this right wing people in Kiev who will come and who will forbid them to speak their language, who will start to make everything like Ukraine is for only for Ukrainians, that Ukrainian people should speak only Ukrainian language and so on. And this fake enemy, it created boundaries between people. People started to afraid each other and still it's going on in my country now. And although people have the same values, they all in South and in North and in Center Ukraine, they, people want freedom, people want justice, people have urge for love and happiness, but they just have this fear of the other. And uh, now we, ha we face that because of these political opinion differences of in political opinion that actually not real but created by media, they are imputed and uh, they create separation among families, they separate friends and they separate even the territory of our country now. As you might know that R Russian military uh, invaded Crimea. It, it doesn't mean that it's bad to have political opinion or religion, but what we should do, we should look into the essence, into the essence of deeds of people, into the essence of people's character, into the essence of religion, but not the name of these all elements. And unfortunately, now we have these flowers on the square which symbolize the loss that we had because of these events and because of the mistakes that we repeated. And I really hope that we will try to unite and we will try to go beyond these boundaries that create media and that we create just our words by our words and that we will finally unite and that no one will make such mistakes again. Thank you.